Sandy, you said that uh, the problem with universities is that when there's a problem, we turn inwards. And I think to a certain extent that you're right. But I, I want to say to you uh, that this university and other universities as well, it's not just the University of Winnipeg, have been consistently talking to government and talking to the outside beyond our walls about issues such as university funding for a good long time. So I agree with you that turning inwards and, and uh, narcissistically stroking ourselves and fighting internal, internal battles is not a good thing, but I don't think it's correct to say that we ignore the external environment uh, in order to do that. That's number one. Number two, Robin, you say that uh, a student-oriented focus is the way to go. I, I, I have to say, uh, you acknowledge this yourself, I, I, I do not know a university, certainly not the University of Winnipeg or any university that I am aware of or have worked in or, or visit that does not believe that, that a focus on students is right and essential. My issue is that uh, a focus on students has to be specifically defined and understood in today's context. And I don't believe that we really understand what it means. So I agree with you that a student orientation is, is essential. Bob, when you talk about business and the, the likening of, of a university to a business and the problems of the free press, I could not agree with you on one hand more that it is correct to think that in the area of technology, for example, the free press and other print media grapple with the same kinds of problems that the university does. But I would disagree with you that the university's grappling with them is of the same nature as the, the way that the free press, for example, grapple. They, they, they are related without a doubt. But the university is in the business of education. You're absolutely correct that the media uh, the free press is in the business of providing what you call content. We are also in the business of providing content, but we have a, a somewhat different orientation. And although part of what we do is to think about the students as consumers, you are right, it is not the whole story. It is not the whole story and can't be the whole story because universities have other things that it is imperative that they do. So yes, we are a business. Yes, we have to think about technology. It is not the only thing that we have to think about. It's not only raw content and how we deliver it. We have other imperatives, other obligations as well. And I guess uh, internationalization, Patrick, uh, uh, I could not agree with you more. If we only think about internationalization as an economic imperative, we are going to go the same way that Australia did. It's, it's, very interesting that Australia should now be thinking about undergraduate education after having failed because they relied on internationalization in the way that you have described. We have examples of what not to do. I couldn't agree with you more. But I also think it's, it's not only the ethical obligation. It is that. It is simply the providing of services to international students. And they are different services from the ones that we must provide to domestic students. So. Uh, I, uh, I, I do thank all of you sincerely, I, uh, and Marcia, thank you as well. I, I could not agree with you more that we have to think about change and when change is appropriate and how to embrace it and so on. I guess what I'm getting at is that, that the, 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 of necessity, you had 10 minutes to speak, my goodness. Uh, uh, you couldn't possibly begin to address uh, the issues in, in any depth. But uh, I have to say that, that the remarks, while stimulating, are only scratching the surface of, of what we have to do. I'm sorry to be provocative. That's what I think. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to schedule some follow-up panels. Uh, now, uh, in Dr. Bessner's remarks, there were direct challenges to at yeah. least uh, three, like four of you. So uh, the, the, the floor is open. Whoever wants to, okay, uh, to take a first. shot back and, and okay, offer. Let me go first, Neil. Um, <laughs> If I accept your premise that you've been going, as a community, you've been going down to the, uh, to the government, then you're doing a lousy job. If you want to be, contra you know. Well, but my point was, but I think you, you missed, I, I know there's lots of efforts. I've been involved from the day when I, went, when I first became chancellor, I was involved in conversations. And I know that Lloyd has gone down with the support of all kinds of people, but it's not working. And one reason it's not working is that, is that I, I believe, is that there's not a concerted effort um, 
a, a c consensus between the various constituencies in the university that need to be working on the same page with a focused political agenda. And what you have right now, uh, typically, is it gets beaten up in here and then Lloyd goes down with, with one or two people to try and get the, uni get the government to, to do something. And that's not the same thing as having the student leadership, for example, who want a, a, a university with low tuitions. Folk, it, when, when, and their focus when, when it comes to the tuition argument is back at the university. Um, it should be down the street, you know, and you should be with them. You should be standing as, a, as, as an administrator, you should be standing beside them, and so should the professors. That, that would be my response. Well, you have to do more of it and do it better. <laughs> Okay, there's one point in which, there's, now, are, are there, uh, Dr. Dean, uh, some of the, or Dr. Farquhar, either, uh, some of the comments were directed at your uh, remarks? Yeah, I think he went after Bob. me before he went after you, Patrick. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I agree with you, Neil. Uh, you, you were um, referring to my uh, advocacy of student orientation, and uh, you said you don't know of any university you've ever encountered that doesn't say students are important and the most important thing to us. Um, that's true. Uh, there are very few people that say they don't like their mother either. But if you ask university <laughs> leaders, um, what, what is your aspiration for the institution? What kind of an institution do you want to become? What, is, uh, what, what image do you want to have? Uh, the vast majority of them will say, I want to be a research intensive university. And we all know that for uh, probably at least 75% of the higher education institutions, that's out of the question. But they'll all say they want it. Um, I've just been working for the last five months trying to established the University of Rwanda and the objective that that government has for this university which is uh, um, in a country one of the very poorest countries in the world uh, whose um, current academic staff only about uh, I think 12 percent have doctorates uh, most of them are expats who are going home as soon as they can get paid more at someplace else. Uh, their aspiration, um, spoken very loudly and very publicly, is to be a world-class university. Well, come on! It, it just—it uh, took me five months to persuade them to change that, to aspire to become a leading African university, and that's a stretch. Uh, people say things that they, they don't know what they're saying. And uh, so, th therefore, you are correct when you say, okay, you're saying, I'm saying, we want to be student-oriented. That want, I, I want that as a priority of focus. And you're saying to me, well, what the heck does that mean? Define it operationally. Don't just give it lip service like we're all giving research intensiveness lip service. And you're absolutely right about that. And I either didn't have time or more likely uh, <laughs> couldn't take the trouble to, to uh, unwrap that. But obviously, um, a, a, a university that wants to become, uh, wants to establish a principal focus on st being student oriented, uh, is going to have to take a very careful look at its, uh, its academic reward system. Uh, right now, uh, good teaching is not generally um, rewarded to the same extent as good research is. The reason for that is that you can't measure good teaching as easily as you can good research, and therefore you don't bother to do it. Well, we have to develop metrics that will help us evaluate the quality of teaching in a way that it can be used in reward systems. Um, we're going to have to, uh, I, I, I think uh, Sandy's quite right in saying, Universities um, have to get out and try and influence the policies that affect them. Um, one of the things we're going to have to try and influence uh, 
And some of you may know that I had some experience with this uh, 15 or so years ago, Marshall will remember. Um, one of the things we're going to have to try and influence is the methodologies and the criteria that are used in the university ranking systems. If we're going to put student orientation as a major priority in our focus, uh, we're going to have to get that reflected somehow in the ranking systems, and it isn't now. The ranking systems are based on research productivity. Uh, and, and so th there are things that simply work against student orientation, which I believe we need, that must be addressed. Uh, another is uh, teaching load. Um, the, we all know that there's a practice in many universities, most universities, for um, senior academics, the, uh, the most accomplished of our faculty members, to have reduced teaching loads, to spend more time on research, and to have great help from grad assistants and other people they hardly ever show up in their classes. That's got to change. Um, and that means that's a mentality that has to change. It's not just a policy, it's a mentality that has to change. Our recruitment approaches to, um, to faculty members. Now I've been out of it for, uh, I, I finished in 96, so that's, that's a long time. But um, in those days, when we recruited faculty members, we looked at publication lists, we looked at citation references, we brought them in, we asked them to give presentations on their research, and we made our choice. Uh, what does that tell us about their capability to, to teach well? Very, very little. And uh, we need to incorporate into our recruitment procedures um, uh, methods and criteria that give us data on how well that person is going to teach, how much that person is going to value uh, the student experience, the learning of students uh, when that person becomes a member of our faculty. So there are all sorts of very practical things that, that need to be changed in order to, to deliver on it, and you're quite right to call me on that. <laughs> okay, now we have also Bob and I think Dr. Uh well, we'll, we'll, why don't we do a couple of quick responses and then we'll move on to some other questions because I know there was a lot packed into that uh, question. Well, uh, Neil, I, I don't disagree with you. I bring up the comparison to the uh, free press not so you emulate the activity but the openness that is needed to deal with this change and that's what you're talking about, Robin, as well, is that the openness to accept different methodologies, different combinations, different reward mechanisms and uh, I was amazed at how closed the so-called open media is to that, and I'm equally disturbed that in other parts of the community, like universities, how closed we might get, and how closed we sometimes do get. Just a, a quick comment uh, in, as a follow-up to Robin. You might be interested to know that in this European Union document I spoke about, there is a recommendation that all faculty appointments include some kind of credential in teaching and learning, which is rather interesting, and, and they explicitly address the, the reward system that, that Robin was talking about. So, I mean, I, I would not dispute with Robin that, in general, uh, the university system is slanted in that way, but it's interesting to see that uh, part of this European Union thing is to directly take that on. Uh, uh, I also wanted to, to just suggest that the, you know, the, the teaching research polarity uh, is precisely one of the things we need to look at. Because understanding what would constitute a great undergraduate education and how we need to address it is inseparable from the question of how that component of our daily activities relates to the, the search and discovery uh, side of what we do. Um, at the moment, m most universities are premised on a system which presupposes there's some sort of peculiar, unalterable separation between these things. And so, you know, we, we have the same assumption that K to 12 is one mode of intellectual operation, and then miraculously, year one of university to year four of university is another miraculously different intellectual operation. And then when you finish year four, when you begin a master's program, that seems to be qualitatively something else. This is obviously nonsense. These are, these are artificially created divisions in the evolution of, or the, I guess, the development of the human intellect. So we need to rethink that. Uh, research is an important part of the same activity 
that we want to see occurring K-12 to uh, in first year universities. It's all about intellectual curi curiosity and that kind of thing. So last point, um, <laughs> just on the question of going, going to government in, with complete unanimity. One of the beautiful things about universities is they're all about dispute. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think you've got to boil down what matters to you about universities, that is freedom to inquire, uh, social commitment, commitment to excellence, all those things. But there'll always be dispute around the edges and debate. That's part of the beauty of these places. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Dr. Han. <laughs> I'd just like to make a few comments on several of these things. Um, you know, I think the implicit analogy about students as customers has a number of problems. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, there is an element of that, but um, there is a reason why some people are students and some people are instructors. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's important not to forget that. I mean, um, people get to be faculty members because they have studied something for a very long time and because they're knowledgeable and because they have thoughts about all of these things. And so to simply assume that either the students or their parents or the community can be clear about what should be taught and how it should be taught, I think is mm -hmm. highly problematic. Um, the other thing, I mean, that relates also to technology because there's, again, an implicit assumption that everything is information, and it's not. I mean, um, information is part of what we impart, but we always used to say, you know, you get a really good student, send that student to the library for four years and he or she will educate himself or herself. Um, information isn't the only thing. And I mean, on, on Bob's analogy, it isn't all content. Um, or it's a wider notion of content because um, knowledge and understanding are much more than information. And it's important that students learn how to convert information into knowledge and understanding. And that's not something that is easy to do with technology. Now, you know, I don't want to say it will never be possible, but I do want to say that we need to think very carefully about how we do that because that's the important thing about what universities do. And just one other comment. Um, I really was taken with Sandy's um, comment about education and health and perhaps reversing the notion of what's important. Um, some of you will remember that uh, Duff Roblin believed very strongly that education was more important than health. He said, and it was this whole business of the social determinants of health, though he didn't talk about it in that way. But he understood that if you have an educated population, you're more likely to have a healthy population. And that's, you know, just quite basic. So um, one of the issues, perhaps, is to help our publics and our governments understand better what that is all about, why education is primary and should be. Thank you. Well, we got a lot of mileage out of one question, <laughs> but uh, there, there, there still is time left for other questions. Uh, this one in front uh, there, the third row. I, uh, I want to pick up again on this question of a student-focused university, and um, I've heard all of you, or most of you, speak about what that means in terms of teaching and curriculum, but I wonder um, if you can share your thoughts on what that might mean for university governance. And um, I guess to give some context to that, uh, really thinking about f the difference between considering students as customers or thinking of them as citizens. And understanding, um, I often think of the University of Winnipeg as a small city. We're a city of 10,000 or 15,000 people. And if we're a small city and if everyone in this city is a citizen, um, to me this is an opportunity to start to um, create a culture that, that students carry on into their lives 
in their neighborhoods in terms of how they're engaging with the way their neighborhoods were governed, in terms of the way they're engaging with um, the issues in their communities. And I wonder if you can comment about trends you've seen in post-secondary that might be contributing to some of the realities we know to be the case around young people not participating as much um, in democratic processes uh, in their communities as well. Someone want to take that on? <laughs> Dr. Dr. Dean? I'll have a go. Um, there's obviously a relationship, which I won't try to articulate here, between submission to authority uh, and uh, a lack of engagement in learning. I mean, so long as we structure the classroom as a place in which, so this is accepting Marsha's point that a professor knows things that a student doesn't know, and therefore a professor has to have a different kind of posi position with respect to the student. Uh, uh, at the same time, so long as our habit is to underestimate the analytical and creative powers of students, uh, we cultivate in them a kind of passivity, which then manifests itself in civic terms through a lack of engagement and so on. I, I hate to keep coming back to Bologna. I realize I've mentioned the place three times. But if you, if you go back to that, that university began as an initiative of students. Uh, they invited professors to come and teach them. And then they decided to pay the, the, the professors to do that. So from the very start, so 900 years ago in our tradition, we have students leading in governance, not exactly setting the agenda for the institution, but having their own uh, views about what, what was needed for them front and center. So I, th I think the the question of how you cultivate engaged citizens is inseparable from how you cultivate an active and creative mind. And if you do it right in the classroom, because your metaphor is exactly right, the classroom, the university, is a microcosm of society. We have some privileges in the university which enable us to do things that you, you have a lot of trouble doing in society. But I think if you, we are in the business of realizing the potential of the individuals who come here. And you need to do it in a way that will have those kind of positive impacts once they leave the institution. OK, there's a, a question right at the corner there. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to uh, challenge Dr. Dean and still he, until he started talking about the University of Bologna again. <laughs> And of course, the University of Bologna was started by foreign students who came to Italy to learn law. So essentially, we had a lot of immigrant students who wanted to go to professional schools, and they were driving the car. But I want to remind him that the University of Paris, uh, of course, there's an ongoing PR battle for, for who's first. And, and they found indisputably correct documents, I'm sure, showing that the University of Bologna is even older than it, it once claimed that it was. But of course, the University of Paris was the University of the Masters. And, and, and there, the car was driven by academics. And, and, and with respect to your previous remark about uh, the continuity of learning from more or less the cradle in, until graduate school, uh, I would say that historically, um, for example, for, for 2,000 years, people studied Euclid. Um, because there were certain things that were known, and, and creativity was, was not the whole deal. And then at a certain point, when, when people had mastered Euclid, they might conceivably make a contribution beyond that. So I think that while there is continuity in education, there are also certain thresholds um, between mastering basic tools um, and to beginning to understand something of the research um, process and then, then contributing to knowledge. So I hope that you're not too much of a leveler. I would find that would be a difficult position for a university president. <laughs> do you want to answer that? Or do oh, no, I, I do. Okay. So, so <laughs> touche, a great point about the Paris-Bologna um, uh, rivalry. Uh, one thing, though, that Bologna has on Paris is the beginnings of academic freedom because it's an act of Friedrich Barbarossa, which, is, which became one of the institutes of Justinian, which protected those international students from interference and exploitation by government in Bologna. So, okay. uh, on, on, I'm, I'm not a leveler, <laughs> by the way. I, I, do, I think there's a continuity, and I think, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, 
an educational psychologist at all, but it stands to reason, of course, the mind evolves and develops, and there'll be phases of development which are slower to come and larger thresholds you cross. Of course, that's the case. However, I just don't see that the mode of approach to education needs to change that much around those random boundaries. Great point, thanks. Dr. Farquhar, did you have uh, something to add on Paris well, I, versus Bologna? I, I, <laughs> I want to come back to the previous question, but first on, on Bologna, <coughs> I think some of the, uh, the <laughs> advances that are reflected in, in the, the European report that you're talking about are the result of the Bologna Accord, which was uh, struck uh, 15 years ago. So whether or not one likes what the University of Bologna originally did, uh, its name is still carrying on in the modern world and it still has some positive influence, I think. Um, the, the question about um, civic engagement of students and their, uh, using their time at university to help them become better citizens, um, a huge, broad question. But uh, I, I don't think we're doing a bad job of that. Um, at, at one level, uh, you can address that in the classroom. That's probably where we're doing the worst job, by and large. Uh, the learning process is an interactive, participatory process, and too often uh, we have a professor who thinks he or she knows more than the students do, and our, it, the job is to just pour knowledge into vessels. Um, so by improving our teaching methodology, I think we can help engage students in their, earn, their own learning, and therefore in the process of what the institution is all about. Secondly, um, I think student associations are wonderful opportunities for students to learn how to engage in a democratic society. Uh, they don't engage in, in those associations as heavily as we would like them to. In fact, not even as, as heavily as citizens of a country engage in the democracy of the country. And perhaps we can do more there as an institution to encourage students to participate in their associations because they're wonderful learning arenas for them. Um, and thirdly, uh, my experience has been that in the governance of the institution itself, Ever since the, the uh, Duff Birdall report in the 1960s, Canadian universities have done a pretty decent job of uh, incorporating <coughs> and uh, considering quite openly and fairly the student perspective in making decisions about the directions and priorities of the institution. Uh, <coughs> you do have to remember that uh, it's the student perspective that is important in that, in that regard. It's not individual particular students because individual particular students are temporary citizens. They're, on, they're just flowing through as opposed to the other people around that table who have lifetime commitments by and large to it. But the student perspective itself is crucial. And uh, I do think that our boards and senates capture that reasonably well now. Dr. Axworthy has a question or comment. <laughs> I actually wanted to uh, provide a historical update. We would not be celebrating the 100th convocation of this university if it wasn't for the student movement in the early 1960s. Two steps. One, at the time, uh, the colleges were the framework of the University of Manitoba system, St. Paul's, St. John's, United College, St. Andrews, and others. There was uh, a decision at the time to move those colleges, which were all located in the downtown area, out to the Fort Garry campus, which was primarily an agricultural um, campus at the time. It was a student association of, this, of United College that first sort of <coughs> challenged uh, the administration and the Board of Regents to stay downtown. That became their primary interest. And the second stage, which was even more dramatic, and I remember it very well because I was a student at the time, that this room, Convocation Hall, was packed to the rafters. If you can imagine cramming 400 students in to debate um, the question about whether the Student Association should withdraw from the University of Manitoba Student Association, the first act of separatism, if you like. <laughs> and it was a debate that was down, and it was all around the 
election of a senior stick, and I think one of the, the person who actually won that is here today. And by a vote of four, five votes, the student association decided to withdraw from the University of Manitoba system. And then that then sort of translated into a similar recommendation that we ask for to become an independent university. So when you ask the question about student government, this institution is founded basically upon that kind of student movement at the time, and that we wouldn't be here otherwise. So uh, I know bologna is important. <laughs> But for this institution, we have to look at where the basic motivations came to stay downtown and to redefine this institution in its own independent way to live up to the traditions. And that was the argument that was used at the time. So uh, I, I was going to mention that to the students in convocation to just realize uh, that there is uh, a paternity to all this that really resides really uh, amongst the students themselves, which I think reinforces uh, sort of the point that Dr. Farquhar made. But I just wanted to make sure there was a, a historical correction on that. <laughs> and not just to belong you. Take um, a bow, have, Joe Stern. We have time for one more question, maybe at the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, uh, Dr. Stern. <laughs> Okay, the, I think the nub of that question was, uh, you know, the, the advantages of collaboration between universities to serve the needs of the, so maybe we, if, because we're almost out of time now, if, we, if there's some quick responses uh, that, uh, that we can make to that. Well, I can say, since I, I guess I triggered your reaction, Frank, um, I, I do think there's huge opportunities for collaboration. I think there's oppor much better opportunities for collaboration uh, between the University of Manitoba and the University of Winnipeg, for example. Um, 
my, my comment was, it, it, Manitoba is, is uh, a subscale government when it comes to offering everything we try to offer. That's a, it's a fundamental principle of any sort of economic organization. You have to get to a certain size to be able to finance certain things. And uh, there are ways we can, uh, but Saskatchewan has that problem. Um, and and uh, so there are opportunities for us, I think, Northern Ontario, uh, to, for us to work effectively with other institutions uh, to, to um, without jeopardizing the quality, in fact, improving the quality of education, frankly. Because if you try and do too much uh, and spread yourself too thin, you, get, you, you, you end up cutting costs in areas where you shouldn't cut costs. And I've seen that at the University of Winnipeg. And it's not the fault of the administration, it's the fault of the fact that, 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 that we're trying to do too much across the whole panoply of education in this province. And we're not focused enough. That'd be my point. Okay, any, another, any other quick... Uh, I, I agree with Sandy. It's, uh, uh, it's not just Manit University of Manitoba, the University of Winnipeg, the University of Brandon, the Red River Community College, the University of the North, and a over, overarching Manitoba answer uh, um, is a very difficult thing. Lloyd and I have tried to sit down with, uh, with David Barnard at the University of Manitoba, and uh, the talk is great, mm -hmm. action is not. Mm -hmm. yes, but I think we have to redouble our efforts, not only from the point of view of administration and being all things to all people, but influencing government. If the University of Winnipeg walks alone, it's no, no, no more, not anywhere near as effective as all the institutions marching together with an with a answer, not with a question. Because we always march to, 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 to Broadway with a question, how much more can we get? But we have to march with an answer. Mm -hmm. How we can not be all things to all people and not have a hospital in a town of 12 people because it's a similar issue. Thank you. Well, um, we could go on for a long time. There were at least a dozen hands in the air last time, and I'm, I'm sorry that uh, uh, we have to draw this to a close. Uh, uh, 11.30 was my, uh, was my deadline. Um, but I, I want to thank everybody here for, for attending and, uh, and, and being part of Actually, I think it was Dr. Axworthy uh, uh, yesterday evening said that uh, convocation, and I'd say particularly a hundredth convocation, is an opportunity to uh, to reflect and refresh, um, uh, think about the the institution, uh, where it's been and where it's going. And I think uh, our panelists have have done a fantastic job uh, today in in talking both about the history of the, uh, the university and other universities, uh, but also uh, looking forward to the future. And um, you know, did we just scratch the surface? Uh, I'd, I'd say, of course, we only scratched the surface. Uh, but uh, to expand on the metaphor, uh, we scratched a lot of surface. And I think if you trace out uh, all of the different uh, opinions uh, and, and uh, propositions that were put forward by our panelists, there's a very good guide uh, to thinking through uh, the, the priority issues that every post-secondary institution, particularly the University of Winnipeg, does have to think through uh, uh, in, in light of the environment uh, that it's facing. So I, I thank all of our panelists uh, as well. Um, thank you for your leadership of this institution. And uh, uh, I think thank you also for, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Dean uh, and then several others uh, commented on the way that this campus uh, feels right now, the way, you know, that I had this experience uh, this morning uh, walking over to this building, uh, as I said, not just, not just the building and, and, the, and the buildings that have been completed, but also the faces on campus and, and the feeling of, of, of dynamism. And, uh, and I think, you know, that's high praise coming from people who, in fact, were part of the building uh, that has sustained this institution uh, and, and puts it in a position to, to look at the future and future challenges with confidence. So thank you for that and also thank you for your, your contributions this morning. And, of course, the, uh, the main event is still to come early this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful day. Um, so, yeah, things, uh, at least for today, <laughs> uh, controversies aside, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're very well positioned. And, and thanks again. Thank you.